Professor Schur. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So as the uh, token nerd on this panel, uh, I'm going to spend my time talking about some of the more technical aspects of these proposals. You can't, you can't talk on this panel. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> if anybody would like to boo, by the way, that, 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 that's okay for, for, for me. Um, so I'm going to focus my attention on why we need uh, better methods of sharing data um, between uh, service providers and network administrators and the government in order to improve our understanding of, of network threats. Uh, and then I'm going to contradict myself, and I'm going to describe why it's probably a bad idea to do this, um, because well, we really don't have an ability uh, to do this in a way that preserves privacy. Um, but first, before I get into that, I'm going to very briefly touch upon the most controversial aspects uh, of these legislations, uh, that being the ability to disconnect large pieces of the network. Um, it, as a Bistonian, uh, I would consider this, in my opinion, to be wicked hard. Uh, isolating a network is much more complicated than flipping a switch. And we tend to think of you know, some sort of um, Frankenstein office where you have some switch and you pull it and everything, all the lights go out. Uh, it's, it's much more complicated than that in the United States where we have very complex networks with a lot of access points to the internet. We have 3G connectivity, we have 4G connectivity, we have broadband, we have uh, these lines. And so a company, particularly a, um, a, a company that's designed to uh, uh, to, to stay up a, a piece of critical infrastructure is going to have um, pretty robust connectivity. So shutting it down is going to be very complex. And complexity, as a computer security researcher, um, it, in my mind makes me very nervous because complexity tends to breed uh, mistakes, security vulnerabilities, and, and in all likelihood, uh, significant expenses. So the kill switch portion of, uh, of these bills have received the most media attention, but I'm really going to focus my remarks today on uh, the, most, the much larger portion of the bills, uh, that being uh, information sharing, uh, best practices, um, uh, and sharing data between the government and critical inf information structures. Uh, and, and I should start off by mentioning that at a conceptual level, I think this is actually a, a truly excellent idea. Uh, developing security standards and disseminating, worth, uh, disseminating best practices is a very worthwhile endeavor. Um, that said, it's important to note that just by following a security checklist, we'll never have truly secure systems. Uh, ironically for that, we kind of need to pull the plug and disconnect it from the network. Um, however, we are getting slightly better at designing secure systems, uh, and one of the reasons we're getting better, uh, although just slightly better, is because we have better um, security practices and security engineering mechanisms. So how might we actually start sharing information between the government and critical services? Um, Ideally, what we'd want to do is establish some sort of repository or database to store useful information that would allow us to perform forensics and also to, um, to understand these uh, attacks in order to better mitigate and prevent them. Uh, and the obvious way to do this is just to merely collect IP packets and throw them into some sort of database. Uh, unfortunately, there are a few problems with this approach. Uh, obviously, storing packets, just um, uh, unmodified packets, risks users and businesses' uh, privacy. And in fact, many of the proposed legislations uh, seek to, quote, protect the privacy and civil liberties of United States persons, end quote. So even during a time of cyber emergency, it's not necessarily a good thing to just uh, discard privacy in favor of uh, protecting the critical infrastructure. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, uh, storing complete packet information isn't particularly useful. And the reason is, is um, the bad guys hide, be hide behind a network of computers that they've compromised called a botnet. So just by looking at source IP addresses, you're not going to be able to find the perpetrator of uh, the attack sitting in you know, some basement somewhere. What you're going to find instead is a network of millions of uh, copies of um, unpatched Windows 98 machines um, that are actively attacking a system. So it's very difficult to actually uh, trace back to the bot master, kind of the, uh, the puppet master who's controlling these botnets. And we really don't know how to do this yet as computer scientists, at least not through uh, automated techniques. So a standard approach is to remove or obfuscate the source IP addresses uh, and to re retain the uh, packet headers and content for analysis. Uh, but unfortunately, this also tends to be very problematic from a privacy perspective. And the reason is, is that there's a lot of personally identifiable information in packet contents. So if you look at um, a, uh, an email, for example, that you might think is spam or something, it might reveal um, information about who the, um, if it's not spam, it might reveal, for example, information about who the sender and receiver are. Uh, if you intercept web requests, that could um, very easily reveal um, you know, the websites that are being uh, browsed. So from a computer science perspective, there are two significant challenges in preserving user privacy. 
First, it's difficult for computers to parse unstructured text like intercepted packets and um, figure out um, and redact the portions that are deemed to contain personally identifiable information. Uh, and we're very far away from being able to do this reliably and efficiently. And second, assuming that we can even do that, uh, we don't know how to share data in a way that also preserves privacy. And the reason is that you can think that an individual packet doesn't contain sensitive information, but when you combine that with other packets and with other outside knowledge sources, um, you can kind of link these things all together uh, and, and gain um, a lot of information, a lot of sensitive and, and, and private information. <coughs> So in general, there's a significant trade-off between usefulness and privacy. And in order to preserve privacy, the, you know, if you anonymize these traces, you have to do it to an extent that it makes these traces almost useless uh, to investigators. So what information would be useful uh, and safe to share? So we want to use the same approach that industry currently uses and collect signatures and patterns or heuristics about known attacks. And what these signatures and patterns will, uh, will do is they'll allow network administrators to quickly identify malicious packets that look a lot like previously seen malicious packets. Um, and we can do this in a way that, such that the signatures by themselves don't contain any sensitive information. So um, this is an imperfect solution, but what it will do is if we can broadly disseminate these signatures, uh, it'll help us better protect our networks. Uh, the problem is that developing these signatures is a very time-consuming and often manual process. So we don't know how to do this efficiently in an automated way. Um, and sharing signatures and malware pa patterns uh, will never protect us against attacks that we haven't seen before. So in summary, sharing data between critical service providers, the federal government, law enforcement, and security researchers and practitioners is re really is an excellent idea. There are already industry and academic conferences and workshops that are dedicated uh, to building standard formats for doing this. And there currently already exist databases and repositories for uploading this information, uh, US CERT and uh, uh, Metasploit are, are two notable examples. The problem is, is that computer science as a discipline isn't advanced enough to do this in a way that the government wants, wants it to be done. The government wants to collect data in a timely manner in order to respond quickly to potentially ongoing attacks. But if data is going to be collected quickly, then we don't have time to build these privacy-preserving signatures or heuristics over the data. All we can really do is collect uh, IP traces, and we don't know how to properly anonymize these traces. So a better approach is really to expand our existing infrastructure to enable the free sharing of malware signatures and patterns, as well as well-scrutinized traces that have been manually inspected to make sure that they don't contain any personally identifiable information. Uh, building such a database won't immediately improve the security of our systems, but it will allow us to better analyze, understand, and learn from our failures. And of course, we should also triple our investments in academic computer security research. <laughs> <laughs> or quadruple. <laughs> thanks, Mike, and thanks for that closing advice. Uh, uh, Susan, give us the international perspective, if you would. Okay, so uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to be here today. I'm delighted to be here. I'd like to come at it from a slightly different angle, and I'm going to focus on sort of human rights implications and particularly look at freedom of expression and privacy rights of users. Um, and I think we probably all know the numbers, but it's worth just looking at them again. There's sort of 600 million users or so of Facebook, uh, about 2 billion people around the world who are using the internet, and around 5 billion people who are using cell phones. And I think it's easy to rattle those numbers off and forget that actually that there are people behind those numbers and, that, and there are sort of personal stories and, and uh, personal human rights. Um, so I'd like to make three observations. Um, the first is about the sort of role of government and uh, international implications. And I think in the last, the last couple of years we've seen many, many governments um, in, in the world starting to take an active kind of interest and in creating policies and activities around how to protect and defend internet freedom. Um, and there's a real potential danger there, I think, if a government in, starts to implement domestic policies and domestic um, actions which conflict with that international um, aim on promoting internet freedom. Um, you know, it could unwittingly give um, other governments and potentially repressive governments the opportunity to justify their own actions in their own countries. Um, we know from seeing sort of rising trends in uh, internet censorship that there's 
more sophisticated attacks on uh, freedom of expression I mean, and you can see that from whether we're looking at the actions that uh, governments in the Middle East and North Africa have taken over the last, last few months through to the way in which conversations are being steered in chat rooms through issues around intermediary liability for companies. So it's really important, I think, as a first point, that governments, when they're thinking about domestic policies, um, are implementing and considering and developing policies in a way that protect security whilst also respecting and upholding human rights and thinking about that international implication and you know, how, it will, uh, how it will appear to other governments. The second point I'd make is around the role of business. Um, so we're in this extraordinary situation, and I think we heard from Mona earlier, earlier on who really sort of described this um, in, in what's happening in MENA. Uh, we're in this situation where increasing amounts of public discourse are taking place over privately owned and privately operated networks. So companies can find themselves in the middle where you have government requests and demands on the one hand and the user rights on the other hand. And I think it's raised real questions around um, the role of business in protecting human rights. And, and sort of thinking back to those numbers, you know, the decisions that companies take can impact millions, uh, millions of people around the world. So where they decide to store data, when they uh, decide to share it with governments and, and who they sell technology to, those, those decisions that companies make can have, can have huge implications. Um, so for anyone who uh, hasn't uh, come across the Global Network Initiative um, yet, I'm, I, I like to describe it as an unlikely coalition. Um, so we have companies, human rights organisations, investors and academics who've come together to really look at how do you provide a framework um, and a set of guidelines to help companies uh, in their decision making when, they're, when they find themselves in that position where they've got sort of government requests on the one hand and user rights on the other. Um, the principles are designed to help companies think through and understand the human rights implications of the technology that they develop products and services that they sell and the markets that they operate in around the world and those principles cover very, very uh, broad suggestions around making sure that there are kind of processes and procedures in place within the company so that you can understand uh, the human rights impacts through to very, very specific things about what to do when you receive a government request. Um, so I think, so the second point is really about the sort of role of business and the responsibilities of business. And then the final point that I'd make is just an, an observation around the fact that there's a huge amount of intergovernmental interest and focus on these issues at the moment. Um, so I'm coming back to that international angle. Um, so the role of business in the protection of human rights is really getting a lot of attention at the moment. So for the last six years there's been um, some work being done out of the UN uh, which was, has been led by Professor John Ruggie, uh, led to the creation of something called the Protect, Respect and Remedy Framework. Again, it's looking at the role of states and the role of business in uh, protecting human rights. Um, that framework has been recently incorporated into the OECD uh, guidelines for multinational enterprises, uh, which also now makes specific reference to internet freedom. And then finally, the uh, UN Special Rapporteur a couple of weeks ago presented to the Human Rights Council um, about uh, freedom of expression online and again was looking at the roles and responsibilities of companies as a part of that. So I think it's interesting, we seem to be at a time where the technology sector is really under the spotlight at a time when there's a lot of international focus and attention on these issues. Thanks. Thanks very much, Susan. And we have 3G connectivity, we have 4G connectivity, we have broadband, we have uh, these lines. And so a company, particularly a, um, a, a company that's designed to, uh, uh, to, to stay up a, a piece of critical infrastructure, is going to have um, pretty robust connectivity. So shutting it down is going to be very complex. And complexity, as a computer security researcher, um, it, in my mind makes me very nervous because complexity tends to breed between uh, service providers and network administrators and the government in order to improve our understanding of, of network threats. Uh, and, and then I'm going to contradict myself and I'm going to describe why it's probably a bad idea to do this um, because well, we really don't have an ability uh, to do this in a way that preserves privacy. Um, but first, before I get into that, I'm going to very briefly touch upon the most controversial aspect uh, of these legislations, uh, that being the ability to disconnect large pieces of the network. Um, it, as a Bistonian, uh, I would consider this, in my opinion, to be wicked hard. 
uh, isolating a network is much more complicated than flipping a switch. And we tend to think of you know some sort of um, Frankenstein office where you have some switch and you pull it and everything, all the lights go out. Uh, it's, it's much more complicated than that in the United States where we have very complex networks with a lot of access points to the internet. Professor Schur. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So as the uh, token nerd on this panel, uh, I'm going to spend my time talking about some of the more technical aspects of these proposals. You can't, you can't talk on this panel. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> if anybody would like to boo, by the way, that, that, that doesn't matter for, for me. Um, so I'm going to focus my attention on why we need uh, better methods of sharing data, um, uh, mistakes, security vulnerabilities, and, and in all likelihood, uh, significant expenses. So the kill switch portion of, uh, of these bills have received the most media attention, but I'm really going to focus my remarks today on uh, the, most, the much larger portion of the bills, uh, that being uh, information sharing, uh, best practices, um, uh, and sharing data between the government.